you hear someone? He's passionate. That love of game shines through. And loves to take chances. And it took me about a week to figure out I knew nothing. Well, all of our games had cancellation threatened all the time. He's the man behind some of the most creative games in history. This actually is a really cool idea, but I don't know if they're going to be able to pull it off. Everybody in that project knew that this was something new and different. The world of gaming wasn't going to be the same ever again. And through it all, remained true to himself. I knew I could survive. Watch out. And that, that courage that he has to always work on the games is the reason that he's revered as a game god. This is the story of Warren Spector. Someone's on our tail for sure. Born in Manhattan in 1955, Warren Spector's early love helps to shape his career. Uh, I was a film freak from the time I was a little kid. Um, spent most of my time in the dark alone, which is kind of strange, but there you have it. Uh, my family wasn't a big gaming family, but we did our share of you know Monopoly, and my dad used to beat me at chess all the time and all that stuff. But really, um, I came to it pretty late. A close encounter at a friend's house leaves him starstruck. The guy who had the Atari 800 and walked into his living room, completely dark, and there were 20, 20 of my friends all sitting around staring at a, a TV screen, and someone was playing Star Raiders. And Star Raiders was a revelation. I mean, it was the first time I felt like I was actually, you know, in a starfighter. I mean, I was doing something really special when I played that game, not just, you know, manipulating pixels or typing in keywords or something. That was a big moment. Warren graduates from college and begins teaching the films he loved as a child. I was teaching film courses at the University of Texas, animation history and an introduction to film analysis and uh, television studies. And uh, the, the funny thing is there, there came a, a point where the chairman of the department called me up and said, you know, you've been, you've been teaching this class that you've been doing for, what was it, 13 semesters, and you're only really allowed to do it for nine, so we're going to have to take your class away. Sorry, click. And, and so I'm sitting there on the floor in my, in my house going, how am I going to pay my, my rent? What do I do? And it was one of those just wonderful moments. I got a call from a guy I'd worked with uh, on uh, the school newspaper, of all things. And he had gotten a job with Steve Jackson Games, a local game company in Austin. And he knew I was a game freak. He said, hey, we're looking for an assistant editor. You want to come on? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> it was all luck, uh, like so many things in life. Uh, I went from Steve Jackson Games to TSR, the folks who do Dungeons and Dragons, and I was kind of bored actually making, making paper games, I hate to admit it, but, uh, and again I got a call out of the blue from a guy who was working at Origin, and he said, hey, we're looking for an associate producer at Origin, are you interested? And I said, well, uh, sure, you know, I played Ultima 5, it was great. In 1989, Warren sacrifices pay for creativity and joins the development team at Origin the game company behind the successful Ultima series. Uh, one of the first things uh, I had the opportunity to do when I went to Origin was work with Richard Garriott on Ultima 6. I came in as the paper game guy who was going to teach the electronic guys what interactivity was all about, and it took me about a week to figure out I knew nothing. Richard Garriott quickly sees the talents that Warren has to offer. Rich was and is one of my mentors. Working with him was an education, believe me. He and I went off for about two weeks. We went to his house and we ate way too much Chinese food and spent way too much time talking late into the night about, about games. Their work pays off and in the end, an entirely new world is created. And we worked together on the plot of Ultima VI and came up with you know, the whole gargoyles invading Britannia plot and came up with the idea that you know, they're not just bad guys, they have their own philosophy and it's equally valid. So it was an immediate immersion in the idea that games don't have to be just about killing. Ultima VI The False Prophet is released in June 1990, and fans praise the game as another great addition to the Ultima series. Creating that kind of gameplay, that rich sort of world, and the multiple solutions to problems stuff that was a part of, of Ultima's even back then, that was my grad school. A few months later, after meeting with the small development company, Blue Sky Productions, 
the Ultima series takes on a new dimension. A lot of trends being indicated of what's going on in the consumer electronics business. Underworld came to origin at a CES show, a precursor to E3. We were all impressed with the, this 3D demo that Paul Nurath uh, showed us. We put together a demo in about a month, basically May 1990, of a sort of 3D texture mapped walls with no floors or ceilings and a little bitmap and, you know, the world's simplest tile editor and no real gameplay and presented it to the Origin folks and said, hey, we can do a texture mapped real-time dungeon game. We pitched it to Origin and they're like, sure, go do it. We're not going to give you any money, basically, but, you know, if it got done, we'd be interested. So we went off and spent the next year or so building the tech up, making it real. Blue Sky returned to Cambridge to work on the game with Origin's financial blessing, but without Warren. And I really wanted to work on that project. I mean, we didn't have a story, we didn't have anything except a tech demo at that point. Um, but it got assigned to another producer at Origin. I was really upset about that. But months later, when the producer leaves the company, Warren recognizes the opportunity. I went to my boss, Al Snell, and said, G give me this. This is going to change the world. I have to work on this. I don't know why, but he said, sure, it's yours. And so uh, I started working with the guys at Blue Sky. And Warren showed up about halfway through and really helped. We were already in the process of thinking, okay, this actually has to ship someday. And so Warren did a lot of helping us sort of focus. That team in that time were, were real special. It was all these like over intellectual kids, you know, and I was, you know, among the worst. And we were just so angst ridden, and, you know, we were up all night and working on our technology, and we had our philosophy of games, and it wasn't working out. And, you know, and Warren would just be like, hey, guys, it's, it's awesome. Look, you know, hey, the game looks so great. You know, let's go. And it was totally inspiration. The team was just like chaos. You know, lightning in a bottle, sort of. They worked all the time, they were, they kept these crazy hours, and they fought like cats and dogs, but they were all pretty much aligned in wanting to make a great game. The production team, headed by Warren, finishes Ultima Underworld in 1992. And things for Warren seem to be going well, but a pair of heavy initials are about to move in and mix things up. Everybody in that project, I think, knew that this was something new and different, and the world of gaming wasn't going to be the same ever again. Ultima Underworld, The Stygian Abyss, ships to stores in 1992. Warren Spector has begun preparing his space among video game greats. Ultima Underworld's unique gameplay and innovative visual style earns praise from both critics. The magazines loved it, it got great reviews. And players. When I first saw the Underworld games, I was actually a software tester in Cambridge, and everybody was gathered around somebody's cube over in customer service, so I went over there and, what's going on, what's going on? That was one of those moments, like the first time you see a 3D game, you know, the first time people saw Mario 64, or the first time you saw good looking sprites on a 16-bit, like when you saw that, it was like, there's like a whole world in there, so it was, uh, it was pretty amazing. It felt like a real world, and you know, you could get a stick and some string and go fishing and make popcorn by throwing corn on the fire. Like, it was just, it was really cool. But for the rest of us, it really set that agenda of, wow, this is really powerful. You know, we can do this thing you can't do in a book, you can't do in a movie, and this is really empowering. Ultima Underworld sells a half a million units. Its success leads to a sequel, Ultima Underworld 2, Labyrinth of Worlds. But after two trips into the dungeon, Warren starts looking for a little shock to his system. After Underworld 2 wrapped up, I was sitting around with Doug, and we were just saying, man, we are so tired of doing fantasy games. Well, gee, should we set it in the space station? Should we have it on the moon? I mean, who knows where it was going to be? So I think Warren felt a little more, I mean, all of us felt a little more ability to kind of do what we wanted to do and not think like, well, how would with an Ultima like this? It was more like, oh, so how's our crazy space station work anyway? System Shock, an open-ended role-playing game, is a chance for Warren to integrate many of his ideas into one game. System Shock uh, actually introduced a, a lot of things that, that seemed pretty innovative. It was one of the, the first games that I know of that was a role-playing game in it, a real role-playing sense. System Shock definitely felt like a revolutionary game. Once you get into games like that, the highly, highly interactive games with a a high degree of object density in the world, things that you can play with or interact with, things that respond to your presence. Other games just don't cut it after that. In March 1994, 
Blue Sky Productions becomes Looking Glass Technologies and releases System Shock with Origin as the publisher. But gamers aren't so open-minded about the open-ended gameplay. Wow, this game is slow. The controls are too complicated. Uh, I don't get it. Is this a role-playing game or a shooter? Hey, why didn't you guys just do Doom? It sold way better. Or why didn't you do a story adventure game? You know, that's what I thought you were doing. That was like a large body of, of people responding to. And then there was a small category of person who utterly understood what we were doing creatively. It once again got enough critical reception and enough people telling us what they liked that it certainly kept us motivated to keep going. I think what they were doing is like laying out a sort of architectural plan for uh, open-ended, first-person perspective RPG hybrids, basically. System Shock sells well, and work on a sequel begins immediately. Watch out. I'm getting strange readings. Take cover. In 1992, Origin is acquired by game giant EA, Electronic Arts, for $30 million. With EA's deep pockets behind them, the pressure is on Origin to deliver, and Warren had everything to lose. Get through a secure airlock before you're sucked into space. Move it! You've got to swing for the fences. You need a home run. It's a hit-driven business. Because I didn't want to be making home runs, and I didn't want to spend, you know, five years and $13 million making one game and praying it was a hit. I wanted to do low-budget things that came out in shorter timelines and the risks were lower and where I made a little bit of money for somebody on a constant basis. But I realized it, it was time to move on. EA went through a period of not really wanting to do anything first person. They just didn't really believe in it. I mean, even System Shock sort of had, well, all of our games had cancellation threatened all the time, but System Shock in particular had a lot of, oh, why are we doing this? This is a waste of time. In the background, Paul Nurath, who I'd been working with for years, he'd been asking me to sign on with Looking Glass, you know, leave Origin, come sign on with Looking Glass. They asked me to come on as a producer, they asked me to come on to run development, they, they asked me to, to any, just come and work with us. About it. So all of a sudden, I was on the hook because, you know, I, EA had told me they didn't want to make the kinds of games I wanted to make. And here's a guy offering to set up a studio, or let me set up a studio, in my hometown. So I get to do the kinds of games I want to make, working with people I love. Well, okay, let's go. Warren leaves Origin to work full-time with Looking Glass as a producer on their role-playing games. His first order of business? A game in development called Thief. We didn't understand Thief at the beginning. I mean, Thief went through two alternate designs that were sort of more story-based larger scope, less focus. And we kept struggling with how to make the story work. It was the beginning of a very long education. You know, I, I kept telling those guys, you've got to stop making games by and for MIT grads. There are only 10,000 of you in the world. So the fiction changed, and it ultimately did become Thief. The time is ripe for a bit of burglary. Thief was, we're going to give you a tiny tool set. You're going to be a thief. We're going to give you everything you need to be a thief in as much detail and however you want. <clears throat> and that's all we're giving you. End of discussion. They would send me copies of it and stuff. And I was just immediately <clears throat> blown away. Like I had heard them talking about it for years. That shot was meant for me. Just the uh, introduction of very analog stealth gameplay where the guards' perceptions were based on light and shadow. Yes, I'm sure it was Gareth in the window. He's dead. Let's head back now. Very creepy, very immersive. I loved it immediately. Looking Glass had a lot of kind of forward-thinking people. Did you hear someone? Being able to see that like stealth is this really powerful thing that can someone build tension. Us? Stop. Is someone following us? In a way that a lot of pure adrenaline rush can. But Warren won't get a chance to finish the game that he's helped parent. Let me be clear about one thing. I left Looking Glass. Uh, before Thief shit. I'm supposed to ah. I left and I started shopping around, you know, uh, another, another proposal. And what Warren has planned next will push the envelope even further. With a series of innovative games behind him, Warren begins to look for a new home. John Romero called me and said, don't sign that. I mean, I, I told him it's too late. It's too late. He said, I'm going to let you do the game of your dreams. 
let me drive down to Austin from Dallas tomorrow and let me try to talk you into joining Ion Store. And he drove down the next day and damn if he didn't convince me. I mean, he said, bigger budget, bigger marketing, game of your dreams. I mean, who's going to turn that down? In the fall of 1997, Warren moves to Ion Storm, where his first order of business is to surround himself with the talent he needs. Sometimes I deserve more credit than I get, sometimes I deserve less credit than I get, but the one thing that is absolutely true is that no one person makes a game. This is the most intensely collaborative medium I can imagine. We're making the kind of games that hardcore players really want to play. While building a team, he starts planning what the game of his dreams will look like. I put together a 30-page pitch proposal for Deus Ex, flew to London for ECTS in 97, and presented it to the executives there, and I put together a budget, and they said, great, okay. I didn't hear from them again for years. It was, it was an unbelievable opportunity. With the full support of IDOS, Ion Storm's parent company, work begins. Ion Storm Austin started off with a bang, working on Deus Ex. No one at the time really knew what kind of game we were making. Like, the team basically sort of diverged into three factions. One group was more or less convinced that we were making a shooter, you know, like a Daikatana. Another percentage of the team thought we were making a really true dogmatic RPG, like an Ultima or something. And then about a third of us knew that what we were doing was something sort of like Underworld or System Shock. And there was a lot of conflict about that. I think in some ways it hurt the game, but in other ways it helped. Getting all these different people with their different viewpoints together and in conflict pulled the game in directions it wouldn't have gone otherwise. By June 2000, Deus Ex, Warren's dream project, is ready to be shipped to stores. And Warren holds his breath. You know, the day we shipped, I, I was just like, I have no idea how this is going to go. I have no idea if people are going to love it or hate it. If people compared our combat model to Half-Life, we were doomed. If they compared our stealth model to Thief, we were doomed. If they compared our, our role-playing to a Baldur's Gate, we were doomed. But if they figured out that they could do anything they wanted, if they realized they had that freedom, and it wasn't just a damn shooter, we were going to rule the world, or at least change it a little bit. And players got it. Just the notion of being able to go through the game in different ways and whether you want to kind of use violence and just stealth and that kind of stuff and just the whole plot and it was like, this is a neat idea, but like, I've heard neat ideas before that just totally fail. And then when you actually played Deus Ex, it was like, oh, it worked. He did it. Deus Ex wins countless Game of the Year awards for its hybrid gameplay, something gamers had never seen before. Gamers are also being discerning, wanting multiple options to what they do in their games. So that means bringing in what might have been old school adventure elements, but tying that in with uh, current boat um, action sequences or special effects or, or role playing elements. Just spotted a sniper in the tower. Even now, I just I don't even know what to make of it. Everybody puts it in their top 10 games of all time. I, I, I don't even know what to say. But its incredible success is almost overshadowed by the storm brewing in Ion Storm's Dallas offices. Ion Storm was a mixed bag. It's really seductive. The inmates running the asylum seems like a great thing. In the end, it didn't quite work out so well. Oh, sorry. My mistake. I mean, the whole idea behind Ion Storm was let creative people do creative things, get out of their way. And up to a point, that's great. And I'm enough of a business guy or a management guy that I could pull it off. I think they had a little more trouble in Dallas. That's, that's pretty much all there is to say. On July 21st, 2001, John Romero resigns and Ion Storm Dallas closes its doors. Undaunted, Warren keeps Ion Storm Austin open and helps refocus on a sequel to the Deus Ex game in late 2003. Warren also begins to think about using his experiences to do some good in the game community. I got involved with the IGDA about uh, three or four years ago. And the idea of an international association, a community of game developers, working professionals and students who hope to become working professionals or analysts. I just think that's vitally important. Glad to know you. What can you tell me about what's going on out there? There's too little talking in this business. Warren's innovative game designs and the talented teams he worked so hard to cultivate continue to influence the industry. Warren's biggest um, ability is to say, 
Yes, that's good, but now how can we make it better? Just be patient and remember your training. Let's get creative, let's think about these things. So him being a very creative person just influences everyone around him to take it to the next level. Good work. He's spoken so much about where games should go in the future. Deus Ex has won over such a, a more mainstream group of people that it's been really cool to watch Warren get his due for leading games. Oh. He's revered as a game god, and it's not an easy thing to have. It is not an easy thing to have. When I look back at 20 years in game development, I'm, I'm, I'm stunned that uh, I've survived that long. The thing I'm proudest of is the opportunity to work with so many great people and to actually help people achieve their goals is pretty special. And doing that in a field that I just absolutely love, I mean, I, I make games for a living, you know, I mean, what could possibly be cooler than that?